welcome everybody to uh, CIF Conclave 2021. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you uh, with us together today. Uh, so just before I begin, a couple of house rules that I wanted to kind of introduce uh, that if you can, if I can request everyone to uh, remain on mute throughout the session and uh, post all their questions uh, on the chat. We will have some time at the end to kind of take some of those questions. My name is Somatish Banerjee. I work with the Circular Apparel Innovation Factory, which is basically an IntelliCap initiative uh, with the objective of really building the capabilities and capacities of the textile and apparel sector in the global south to transition from a linear uh, approach to uh, uh, a circular industry. Today we are uh, going to deliberate on a topic uh, which is reimagining jobs and livelihoods in the textile industry in the context of the global south. The transition of the textile and apparel industry to a circular economy and particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic is said to be characterized by significant shifts and disruptions in the established ways of doing business. While the pathway to this transition is marked by improved technology, smart manufacturing, and better resource utilization, it also bears deep implications on the overall future of work, the workforce, and the livelihoods of millions of people who are, that are closely tied with this sector and its transition. Women in particular, who account for a significant section of the industry's labor force, uh, almost 80%, tend to be disproportionately impacted by these disruptions. The spectrum of interventions to ensure an inclusive future of work will need to cover a range of key aspects, including workers' rights protection mechanisms, future skills development, and unlocking alternative economic opportunities, such as micro-entrepreneurship. Today, we have with us a panel of four eminent speakers who will be bringing in their unique yet interconnected lenses to reimagining jobs, and livelihoods in the textile industry in the context of Global South. So let me introduce uh, you to Mr. Vivek Singh, who's the Head of Portfolio Employment and Entrepreneurship at IKEA Foundation. Welcome, Vivek. Uh, Jennifer Babbar, Jabbar, uh, who is basically the RMG Lead, uh, Director of Human Rights and Legal Aid uh, Services, Social Compliance and Safeguarding at BRAC. Welcome, Jennifer Pang. We have Christina Yeager, who's the co-founder and managing director of Humus Environmental Hub. Environment Hub. Uh, welcome, Christina. And last but not least, we have Abhishek Jani, who's the CEO of Fair Trade India. Welcome, Abhishek. And to uh, moderate this wonderful session that we have in store for you, we have Priya Krishnamurti, who's the founder and CEO of 200 Million Artists. Welcome, Priya. So without, without further ado, I would just like to hand over the proceedings to Priya. All over to you, Priya. Thank you. Thank you, Somatesh. And uh, so excited to be here. Um, and um, welcome to the Cave Conclave, uh, to all the um, audience that has joined in. And uh, we are here to talk about reimagining jobs and livelihoods in the textile industry. Uh, like Somatish said, I'm Priya Krishnamurti from 200 Million Artisans, your moderator for the day, uh, or for the session. And I'm really excited to speak to all our panelists today who, who really represent pioneering organizations. And I've been reading about their work and they're doing, doing some amazing work on the ground. Um, just to set the context. So when I was asked to moderate the session, the first thing I wanted to do was um, figure out what the num what are the kind what's the kind of numbers that we're speaking about when we talk about the textile and apparel industry. And in India alone, I was shocked to find that the textile and apparel manufacturing segment is over a hundred billion dollar market. And it's one of the largest employers after agriculture providing jobs to over 45 million people directly and over 100 million people in just allied industries. And if we expand this conversation and expand this to other countries in the global south, the footprint is much larger. And incidentally, uh, much of this workforce continues uh, to operate in the informal economy with very little social protections, um, which is significantly becoming a big uh, cause of concern. Um, and last but not the least, what's also significant, especially for me, um, is that 80% uh, of those employed in this sector 
are women. And before we get to the questions to our panelists, um, I'd like to invite you to listen to the story of one such woman in Bangladesh. Uh, could you play the video, please? Uh, Tanushri, if you can halt it, I think I'll share screen. I don't think the sounds no worries. গার্মেন্টস সেক্টর আমাকে অনেক কিছু দিয়েছে যেমন পৃথিবী আমার কাছ থেকে নিয়েছে আমার বাবা নিয়েছে এবং আমার জীবন থেকে আমার হাজবেন্ড উনিও মারা গেছে তো হচ্ছে যে একজন একা মেয়ের পিছনে মানুষ কথা বলার মানুষ অনেক থাকে আমি যখন প্রথম ছোটো ছোটো কারখানায় চাকরি করতাম তো তখন আমি কিছুই জানতাম না আমি একটা সুতা কাটবো কীভাবে সেটাও আমার জানা ছিল না যে কিভাবে এই গাছটা সুতা কাটে মাঝে মাঝে অনেকের কথা শুনে কান্না পেত খুব কান্না করতাম যে আমি কাজ জানি না আমাকে অনেকে অনেক খারাপ কথা বলে বা কাজ পারি না বকাবকি করে সম্মুখীন হইলে ওটা সমাধান করবে একজন অপারেটর কে কিভাবে কাজ দেখানো হবে আমার সুপারভাইজার হওয়ার পর থেকে আমি আমার আর্থিক দিক থেকে অনেক স্বাবলম্বী পরিবার পরিবেশ এবং আমার ফ্যামিলি থেকে আমি অনেক সম্মান সম্মান পেয়ে যাচ্ছি এবং আমি চেষ্টা করব যাতে আগামী পাঁচ বছরে নিজেকে একজন এটিএম এর পজিশনে নিয়ে যেতে পারি একজন নারী যেহেতু একজন মা তার সবার আগে প্রায়োরিটি তার সন্তান এখন আমাদের ইপিক গার্মেন্টসে ডে কেয়ার আছে অনেক মায়েরা তাদের সন্তানকে রেখে এবং খুব ভালোভাবে রেখে তারা নিশ্চিন্তে কাজ করতে পারে অনেক গার্মেন্টসেই সেটা নাই এবং এই জন্যই অনেক মায়েরা কাজ করতে পারে এই জন্য আমাদের বাধা আসবে যেমন আমাদের সফল করার জন্য আমাদের একটা সেক্টর আছে এবং আমাদের অসফল করার জন্য আমাদের একটা সাইড আছে কিন্তু আমরা অসফল নেগেটিভটা দেখব না আমরা যারা আমাদেরকে সফল করতে চাইছে তাদের হাত ধরে আমরা সফল হওয়ার চেষ্টা করব to making Fatima's dream possible. I hope she does become the ass assistant production manager, but it does uh, bring us to our first speaker and uh, my first question to the panel. Um, so many such women on the factory floor and many such workers on the factory floor will see significant changes in the coming years as automation and adoption of circular approaches set in. Uh, Jennifer Jabbar, um, Jennifer, can I ask you to um, respond to um, what do you believe uh, are some of the trends that would define the future of work, especially in this landscape? And we take into account the factory flow. And thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Priya. Um, 
there's going to be a lot of significant changes and we know automation is coming in. Um, circularity is something that brands are requiring now. Um, industry developed, I think all um, R&D industries have developed in um, a sort of piecemeal fashion and the growth trajectory took place. Even in Bangladesh, it was nothing different. Um, there were the quota systems and people took advantage of that. And the industry grew in a piecemeal fashion um, from rented apartments to purpose-built factories in Bangladesh and um, workers came in um, mainly because people thought that women can sew. So it happened that women who can sew were in the production floor sewing and men were always considered um, stereotypical roles. Men can manage and hence they would be in the mid-management positions. Now, I think over 40 years of working in RMG, um, it's unfortunate, but women have remained on the sewing operation lines and men continue to occupy the mid-management positions. And if you talk about skilling and bringing women in mid-management in Bangladesh, um, we see that 95% women are on the operating floors, but mid-management positions, we hardly see any women as line supervisors, et cetera. Now, if we go to industry for automation, adaptability, agility, we need to bring these women and I think um, a success factor for Bangladesh was the critical mass. Since women came in the critical mass, they were able to continue the 40 years and still continue. Um, and mid-management, um, the owners didn't see that this was necessary. But if we go to industry four now, we need to skill these women. If we do not skill these women and say women drop off, then mid-income cannot be achieved like Bangladesh is becoming a mid-income country. You cannot do it with um, women being left behind. So, and or if women have proved to be able to be agile and multi-skilled, then we need to think of the new jobs that are coming that automation actually brings in flexibility and also um, repurposing these women workers to these jobs. It makes it easier. Automation actually helps. So thinking that men can do only automated, um, say small and medium, we see, um, I see the future next five to 10 years being more concentration on factory flows on small and medium. I and say on the upper mid management on digitization, the 3Ds and the fits and all of that. But uh, you can't leave women behind. So the future, and I think we are beginning to recognize that. And I think Global South, all everyone is beginning to recognize that this skill and this adaptability to the new changes, we would need to take these women and skill them for the future. And that is an initiative which Brack has started and some other players have started um, to skill on soft and hard skills and sort of break certain perceptions. Um, I, I can, uh, I'll stop here now if yeah. there are any further yeah. questions. No, that, no, I think what you say is so valid, uh, taking women along and taking, I mean, communities along and, is sort of key to building that inclusive future in so many different ways. And here I'd like to bring in uh, Mr. Vivek Singh from the IKEA Foundation. Uh, Vivek, thank you again for joining us. Um, and I'd like to bring, uh, talk about the, you know, again, touch upon the idea of trends and what you're seeing. Um, given that IKEA Foundation's approach to employment and entrepreneurship, specifically green entrepreneurship, there's a focus of, on working with communities, on inclusion. In this context, could you perhaps share uh, trends that you're seeing that define the future of works, uh, work from the foundation's lens? Vivek, can you hear me? Am I muted? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It, it always happens, yeah. So uh, let me begin with, uh, our, uh, let me start from where uh, Jennifer kind of, you know, just uh, 
uh, uh, gave a very good point for us to think through based on experience uh, in, in, of working in, in Bangladesh. And uh, I, I just wanted to add that and build on that further. Uh, you know, it's, it's a valid point that, uh, that you know, comes out from Bangladesh that automation is kind of affecting generally workers, but if you look at women workers are being more affected because for certain reasons, men are you know, taking on to the technologies and automation uh, for certain reasons faster. And this is where we have to be really conscious, conscious and intentional of how we upskill uh, women workers so that they are not left behind. To this, I will also add, you know, the, the point that the question that you asked uh, Priya about uh, uh, the transferable skills, uh, skills, you know, like for example, uh, the digital skills or team working skills or planning and organizing skills, etc. Now these become very critical especially when uh, workers are facing disruption. And it helps in reducing uh, the disruption in the whole process. So I think that becomes very important when we are looking at you know, bringing, bringing or developing the capability of, uh, of workers. Uh, from the IKEA Foundation perspective, I think uh, one thing I would highlight is uh, the textile waste, which is a valuable resource. And this is emerging as a material and a potential area for creating opportunities for workers in the textile and the garment industry. And uh, also, you know, it is impacting and will continue to impact livelihoods. Uh, and if you just look at some of the data and statistics like Circle Economy uh, came out with some uh, statistics like uh, for, very, for every 1,000 of uh, textile waste handled, uh, about 20 decent jobs are created. And similarly, for every kilogram of waste, uh, which is uh, reused, it can save up to 7,500 liters of water. So these are some of the promising data points which uh, clearly indicate that there is a high potential of harnessing the potential of textile waste when we are talking about improving like, incomes, livelihoods, as well as looking at you know, how we take care of the environment because both are interrelated. Uh, we have to look at livelihoods and the future trends of work and workers along with the planetary resources that uh, we have. And this is what, you know, which came out quite strongly in the plenary session that we had. The other area uh, I would highlight is the untapped potential of uh, entrepreneurs, uh, particularly the micro, small and growing uh, uh, entrepreneurs. And we all know that they have a very critical role to play in any economy. And especially when we are seeing uh, during the COVID time, and it continues that a lot of, uh, you know, movements happened from cities, from urban areas to rural areas. And uh, people after going there did not have enough opportunities. So this is where we feel that we need to kind of consciously work towards uh, developing the capabilities of small and growing businesses who can look at local development, look at local skills, local resources, and create opportunities there. And finally, I would say that, uh, you know, these transitions towards uh, developing textile waste as a resource and moving towards circular economy in production processes and in our consumption habits, uh, this will certainly entail uh, change in roles across the value chain. And just quickly to mention that, you know, uh, for example, jobs and uh, related skills in repair, in maintenance, in sorting, in collection, in um, resale of clothing, now, all these are coming up and they are going to play a critical role and it will become much more relevant as we transition towards a circular economy. It is true that, you know, the pace and the adoption of these uh, uh, approaches and, and these opportunities will differ depending upon, you know, where one is in which country, one region. But sooner or later, we have to embrace and we have to kind of, you know, orient ourselves to move towards these directions. So uh, those are the points I have a table at the moment. Thank you, Vivek. Um, and speaking of uh, the role of entrepreneurship, I think this is a great time to bring in Christina. Um, if, we, if we were to talk about the role of entrepreneurship and Vivek touched upon, you know, how textile waste and waste workers are also going to become really an important part of the value chain. Um, could you perhaps touch upon, you know, from a UNIS Environment Hub's perspective, uh, what are some of the trends? And especially if we have to look at it from an entrepreneurial lens uh, um, moving forward. Sure, thanks Priya. Um, I, I think what we are seeing um, as a, as a long-term trend is that 
um, uh, there's a growing demand for sustainability driven from the consumer side, right? This has been going on for several years. And I think particularly now also accelerated through the pandemic and all of the discussions that we are having around uh, climate change. And this also highly affects the fashion industry. And um, all of the big brands um, are aware of that and they're trying their best um, to um, 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 move towards a more sustainable path, also to see on how they can incorporate um, the circular principles. But if you're a big company and your business model is based on a linear model, it's impossible to do that, right? And that's where entrepreneurs, on the other hand, um, can come in by designing circular business models from scratch. And we at UNOS Environment Hub, we work with the social business methodology. And there, even further, your objective, that motivation for starting your business is to actually address an environmental and social issue. So um, you're not necessarily looking on where are the greatest economic challenges, but where you can actually have the greatest environmental and social impact. And I think there we see a lot of business models developing that, that Vivek just briefly also mentioned in the areas of uh, repair, reuse, remanufacture that avoid the creation of waste in the first place. Nevertheless, um, of course, we still have, and it will take a lot of time, and there will always be a certain amount of waste, both in the post production as well as the, the post uh, consumer garments that are left over. So, also, a, a huge, I would say, a huge window of opportunity um, with a lot of um, entrepreneurial and uh, job creation opportunities in seeing on how do we deal with that waste instead of uh, dumping it uh, or burning it um, to, yeah, to pull out all of our creativity on what we could be doing with uh, these type of uh, base streams. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, Abhishek, I'm going to uh, come to you because this, I mean, and this is also a great time to come to you uh, as part of especially your work with Fair Trade India. You support many entrepreneurs and drawing from Christina's thoughts, uh, on how do we build uh, businesses from scratch that actually serve the needs of the future. Uh, could you perhaps share what you've been following, trends that you've been following and you that you believe will be defining uh, as we move along in the future? And especially it would be nice if you could perhaps touch upon, you know, aspects like wages, social security, and those things that will also become integral as we talk about inclusion and a circular future. Yeah, thank you so much, Priya. And, you know, really, uh, I want to first commend the really inspiring work BRAC is doing. That video, you know, with the story of uh, Fatima B was really inspiring. So, um, you know, that that actually points in the direction that Petrade is also working in uh, and something that we're increasingly seeing gaining prominence, uh, which is recognizing the dignity of labor per se. Uh, and I think, um, you know, um, you know, dehumanization in the production processes has been happening for a while. Well, you know, it just comes down to numbers and KPIs and so on. So it's all needed. Of course, we need uh, to make sure we're doing it efficiently. It's good for the environment as well. But it's also important to recognize the dignity of labor and to recognize that there are lives and families associated with that. So at Fairtrade, uh, we are seeing and we are driving a move towards what we uh, call the living income and living wage coalition. So we are part of the Living Wage Coalition, uh, where we're saying the conversations now need to move beyond uh, just the minimum income, right? Which is basically saying you should just be fulfilling your calorific value needs. It should be about ensuring that everybody, every human on this planet should be entitled to a life of dignity. Um, and even if they're on the textile sectors, we need to ensure that those conditions are there, the working conditions, but also the livelihoods to, to kind of um, ensure everybody has that baseline of a life of dignity. Uh, so I think that's, of course, the conversation is just starting. Uh, I think we're getting some early adopters, but uh, we're, we're continuing with our push on that and we are optimistic as to the future of it. We're seeing more and more businesses uh, taking that on. Uh, we're seeing different factors coming in. So I think Christina rightly mentioned uh, the consumer trend uh, and the consumer awareness and engagement, particularly in fashion and it is something that is driving this. We're seeing regulatory aspects coming into the picture from Europe as well as in countries like India. Um, so those are the motivations and there are other market-based factors 
which is incentivizing uh, entrepreneurs across the valley. So I would say those are the kind of headlines there. Uh, something else that we're seeing um, coming up is an emphasis um, on traceability and transparency. So I think all of this is also saying that for a long time in our work, we've seen that there's been only an emphasis on what we call the tier one, right? So maybe the CMTs, if somebody was a little ambitious, they would probably go to the knitters and the weavers. But now uh, we're seeing increasingly that, again, thanks to regulation like you know, HRDD, Human Rights Due Diligence Acts, uh, Duty of Vigilance Acts in France, uh, we're seeing people now needing to take responsibility for the whole chain, right? Not just stay to the start of the value chain, but even need to engage all the way down to what's happening at the farms. And so that's another area where Fairtrade has been doing a lot of work. And you know, we see uh, that also being recognized as a workplace. You know, I think farms are workplaces for farmers and, and, and people they employ. So uh, I think the conversation is kind of uh, building up uh, on, on, a, on a qualitative parameter, you know, as I was saying, but as well as going deeper uh, and we are optimistic that uh, this is the direction it should take, uh, and we, we are working on that. Thank you. Uh, and all that thought about, uh, you know, the farm is also workplace and uh, worker rights, because we are going to come back to that, uh, that and deep dive uh, as we move along. But I'd like to bring in uh, Jennifer again here, uh, because clearly Fatima left quite the impression on all of us. Um, and if we have to really, you know, address the elephant in the room, and let's face it, if you're talking about about 70 to 80 percent workers being women, then we will have to talk about the value chain and the gendered nature nature of it. And Jennifer, I mean, you've already uh, touched upon it, and there are clearly a lot of preconceived notions around what women can do, what we cannot do, and so on and so forth. Um, how do we navigate um, when we're talking about you know the shifts that we all need to make? How do we navigate the gender dynamics on the factory floor? And Fatima is obviously a great example of what upward mobility for women could look like and where that can go. Uh, could you also perhaps share a few more examples uh, of interventions that address these trigger points um, on increasing women's empowerment and even safety in workplaces? So this is a large topic area. Um, and I think it's a problem in the global South itself. Um, patriarchy and stereotypical roles is um, something that is at the core of the global south and Bangladesh is no exception, that um, the perception and how the industries grew was women so stereotypical role, men will not so, and hence women occupied this pro position and came in the critical mass. And, and like I touched upon that men, men can manage, they are the supervisors, they are the leaders, and they will occupy this mid-management. And unless we break these stereotypical roles, we can't actually advance. Um, so if you want any sort of um, change to happen, even in automation, um, even in circularity, you're going to have to change perception change mindset. That is the root of everything. You can deal with the trunk and the branches later, but if we don't address the root, we can't really actually move forward for any change. So perception is one thing. And then looking at those triggers, um, why those perceptions, um, this patriarchal mindset, now you see that women can work. They are able to, um, basically, they may know more than probably the line supervisor having worked for so many years. They may have solutions to the problems. So um, when I talked to manufacturers in Bangladesh, they said that Jennifer mindset change is a big issue um, from, for the mid managers, but it's also for the owners, um, the mid managers, the owners, and even the women workers. Sometimes they feel also, because the industry has been there for 40 years in this particular role, that should we answer to a woman leader? So that also is there. So we need to work on these trigger points and actually motivate women workers. Epic is a classic example of what we showed in the video, that if they are 
given the opportunity, they can do. So it's not that they cannot do. And the perceptions we have that automation and digitization, men can only do. Women can do, men and women can do. I mean, there, there is no particular skill that men have that women cannot have and uh, vice versa. So, so breaking the perceptions of the industry and having giving the opportunity to women, motivating them, showing them the business case, showing them what it's involved for them. All of the women want to retain their jobs. No woman wants her job to go. She manages her family. She manages the education of her children more than I would say men do. And um, she, she looks at the family as a social structure. So motivating these women and basically bringing them onto advanced skills is something that needs to happen. The new roles that come in, why are we always thinking of men? Why are the owners thinking of men? Why not the women? Um, they cannot do it, who said? So I think Epic was an example that these things can happen and these changes can happen. And as the new jobs come in, those skillings have to be there. We need to break the perceptions, work on change management behavior. We need to work on basically bringing at all levels from the production floor, the women to the mid managers, to the um, owners themselves. And it won't be just having one or two women supervisors in the mid management position because they will fall off because they will not be able to compete with the male counterpart. As they came in the industry in the critical mass on the operating floor, in the mid managerial position, also you need to have women in the critical mass hundreds of mid-management, then they will remain and they will not uh, have the fear that can I do or also the obstacles that mid-management men would maybe create. So if they, we occupy that mid-management with women on a critical mass level, then I think that many of these issues and conducive work environment breaking patriarchy and bullying and say harassment issues will also be addressed if you bring in a mass level mid management female alongside the male. So I'll stop there, but I think um, these are some of the issues we need to focus on. Thank you. Jennifer Appa, I mean, if you were in person, I would probably stand up and applaud because I just got goosebumps <laughs> as you were talking. Um, but, uh, very, very important uh, conversation to be had because uh, let's face it, those the mindset shift is really where it all has to begin for all of us who are invested in this conversation. And here again, Vivek, I'd like to bring you in. As um, you know, when, when we talk about moving from the factory floor to addressing needs of communities, which is something that IKEA Foundation is committed to, especially informal communities as a whole, um, how can we deepen working with communities while designing models to ensure that nobody is left behind? And could you perhaps share uh, some takeaways from the projects and learnings that you are you know, involved with uh, that we can learn from in this conversation? Yeah, thanks, Priya. I think it goes uh, without saying that uh, how important it is to focus on people and work with communities um, when we are working towards circularity and promoting green entrepreneurship and also trying to address the trends of the future of work and workers. Uh, I will highlight uh, three aspects here. Let me begin with um, by saying, bringing in the focus on young people. Uh, prioritizing working with young people, I think it's uh, the, a very important aspect when we talk about communities and ensuring that no one is left behind. <clears throat> and here I would say that, you know, it is important to understand the aspirations and needs of young people and not what we think, that's <clears throat> what, sorry, and, and, and not we go with think that, you know, what would work for them? Uh, because many times, you know, we, we kind of create programs or create interventions uh, going with our perception and, you know, the, what, what Geneva was also talking about. And that really doesn't help. Also, if you look at uh, the potential of uh, young people, like South Asia has a huge population. And if you look at the, I mean, we have a young population across the world, but if you look at the World Youth Report of uh, 2020, uh, they quote a particular data point that 97% of the young people are uh, working in the informal economy in the developing countries. 
And uh, to us, it's a huge potential group to work with. And especially when we are talking about moving towards circularity, we need to have innovative ideas. We need to encourage people to think out of the box, to find creative solutions. And if you look at the young people of today, they are ready to take risks. They are ready to innovate. They are ready to you know, think out of the box and come up with solutions, which can not only create you know, uh, employment opportunities, uh, uh, start and uh, grow enterprises, but also contribute towards the environment. That's one thing. The second thing is I will certainly touch upon women. And <clears throat> here I would like to highlight two things. I mean, uh, definitely we have, we, have, we have been hearing this, that women, they kind of have been traditionally involved in the textile sector. So, uh, for, so we have to consciously work towards, you know, uh, upskilling and reskilling opportunities. But there are two other things which come up. One is that what the film that we saw, and it's really heartening to see that in BRAC, uh, efforts are being made to, uh, you know, encourage women to be mid managers, and that's what I was trying to arrive at. That uh, while we look at upskilling and reskilling opportunities, we have to look ahead and create aspirational roles for women. For example, you know, women managers in the supply chain, because this is not only taking women to the next level of development, but also uh, creating role models for others. And this takes time, it takes effort, and takes patience to kind of, you know, create that kind of. Uh, conducive environment. The other thing is that um, when we are talking about programs uh, of developing capabilities of women, there is, we, we, we are seeing an increased interest and traction in terms of mentoring programs. And, and especially when we are talking about mentoring programs, I would highlight that, uh, and this is based on experience, that having a, a psychosocial component becomes very, very uh, important and useful. And especially because, you know, uh, and, and this, this component has to be uh, tailored towards a women entrepreneur's need. Uh, simply because if you look at the journey an entrepreneur goes through, it is full of challenges, ups and downs. And uh, it can be very unnerving. And especially when it's a women entrepreneur, you know, it gets all the more pronounced. So how do you have these kind of uh, psychosocial component, which, you know, takes care of the mental well-being? Uh, physical safety, uh, cultural issues that we are talking about. And we did a program with UNDP. And in that program, uh, we, we really uh, got to know that women value such uh, uh, psychosocial support because it helps them to navigate better the uncertainties which they face as an entrepreneur. So, you know, these are the aspects which I would uh, uh, table that when we are talking about communities, when we are working with them, uh, we need to kind of, you know, uh, keep, the, keep, keep the, those aspects in mind. And finally, uh, I would say that, you know, it's very important to keep uh, a pulse on what the community needs and aspirations are evolving because we are living in a very fast moving world. So how do you keep uh, a pulse on what the community wants and what are their needs? And uh, there are many ways of doing it, simple mechanisms of having a quick pulse check or ensuring that you know, we work with people who are from the community so that they bring the local you know, networks and local relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So these are things which I think uh, we, uh, you know, we have seen that through our partnerships and we also encourage that we build those in the community development programs that we uh, do as a part of the foundation's work. Um, Vivek, there were so many things that you said that resonated uh, with me, especially when we talk about uh, building role models, especially for women entrepreneurs. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the best example, but having, you know, honestly, that psychosocial support is so critical, uh, especially because we are the first ones who will, you know, uh, have the gazillion imposter syndromes about why we need to do what we need to do. So, and especially for micro entrepreneurs, I can only imagine what that kind of support could mean uh, as they move along. Uh, the other aspect is also mentoring and how we work with communities. So if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're also saying is that it's uh, best to actually <coughs> create solutions in some ways yeah. to communities rather than taking that top-down approach. And this is, uh, I think, sort of a, a nice segue to bring in Christina because what they are also doing uh, is to build that kind of, you know, building and designing models uh, where we are, I mean, we are, clear, we are clear that business has a role to play and it can potentially bridge that gap between technology and human competencies. So um, 
Christina, perhaps could you share, um, you know, how do you see the principles of social business being applied while we're re reimagining the future of work? And how can we achieve this kind of holistic change uh, with community entrepreneurship as we move forward? And perhaps if you could share examples as well. Sure, absolutely. I think, um, I think, as I said, I think it, it can be a very good bridge because I think digitalization and technology can bring a lot of good and we should not be afraid of it. We have been doing some work in Ethiopia this year um, where we've been looking at post-industrial waste and then visiting um, the industrial parks um, where the garment um, factories are operating out, um, often being uh, located uh, a bit farther outside in, in excluded areas. You would literally have physical billboards at the beginning of the industrial park where it was written what kind of waste streams and what quantities are available and someone would physically have to go there call up the people and the linkages in between where waste is generated and where a recycler or the collector is, is just not given. So I think there a digital platform could bring in a lot of efficiency in um, um, enabling basically um, that, um, that sector to work more efficiently. And um, we can, I think, reskilling, upskilling, um, uh, as mentioned um, uh, previously, are options for positioning uh, people towards, towards other jobs. Um, we should also not forget that in the end, um, even if there's a digital solution, you will still need some manpower, for example, in the case of a digital platform to then manage the logistics. So it's not that the jobs are completely going away. I think there's also a reshift. And again, the real upskilling can help. And again, I would also highlight entrepreneurship is also an option. And um, I love Professor Yunus always says, human being are born as entrepreneurs. It's in our human DNA. And um, I think it depends on the enabling environment and the support, the mentorship, what people can receive in order to be successful not, or even be encouraged. You know, For so many people, it's not an option because um, they, well, they would not think that this is something they would be able on doing or that it's actually an option for them. So I think this is also something where we can work on. And um, so I would say, I, I would rather look positively on the development of uh, digital technological progress. Yet, of course, we should be cautious. Um, um, also, especially when looking at artificial intelligence, um, because in the end, um, um, who, who, is, who is developing the artificial intelligence? Who is feeding the data that will evolve into it? So I think this, the social conscious there is, is very important that also this is incorporated or that through um, legal frameworks, um, we, we create actual frameworks where we prevent um, something bad from happening of these developments. And um, other than that, I would I would say that um, the uh, the literally the, the connection and the integration, also especially from informal sector workers, is something that we should be looking at, and which is something that um, uh, we have been seeing also in on other waste streams. For example, when looking at solid waste, uh, plastic plastic waste, and the recycling. On the one hand side, we have huge amounts of waste being generated. And we have recyclers that are under capacity, that are that that have too less input material. Often, their um, um, facilities they run under capacity, which makes it again difficult to further steer investments or actually to to um, uh, to get more investments into these sectors because the input waste streams are not secured um, because of those challenges in the logistics and in the collection and the in the, in the first. On the, on the first side. So I think there again, a um, lot of potential things to be done where um, entrepreneurs and social business entrepreneurs um, are already focusing on. And I think where we need more attention and I think also more collaboration because you cannot just leave that up to social business entrepreneurs. And that's actually something where I often get upset. It's kind of like, oh, like the social business entrepreneurs, they can take care about the waste. No, like it's not just that, right? Um, we need extended um, producer responsibility schemes 
and collaborations from both private sector and support from the public sector. Thank you, Christina. Um, so what I'm also hearing is that um, technology, it, we need to use technology. We can't avoid technology, that's a given. Uh, it can embed the kind of efficiencies we are looking for as we move forward, especially for to drive the kind of impact all of us are looking at. But again, we need to be mindful because at the end of the day, let's face it, uh, a lot of AI is, uh, and no offense meant to anybody, but it, a lot of it is actually designed by men. So it does not take into account, uh, you know, the nuances and the nuanced approaches that are required to uh, drive that kind of inclusion. Um, and on um, the, um, the, uh, the whole area of waste workers, please hold the thought because we have a fantastic video coming up, but I will jump to Abhishek before we uh, go to the video itself. Uh, Abhishek here, I think it's a really nice segue to really talk about, um, it's, we can't do this alone, that's a given. Um, and we do require buy-in from many stakeholders. Um, and how, my question to you is how do we incentivize and how do we as control stakeholders as well drive mindset change at scale um, and incentivize both global brands as well as SMEs to safeguard workers uh, in, as the future evolves. Uh, is there a business case to be made for intentional action uh, for worker protection? Uh, could you perhaps speak to that? Yeah, thanks, Priya. Yeah, I, um, you know, I completely agree uh, with what Christina has also just shared that we have to do it in a collaborative uh, spirit and approach. Um, you know, at Fairtrade, we call it an ecosystem approach. So, you know, different people contribute in different ways. Uh, at Fairtrade, we're trying to create an ecosystem for sustainability and, uh, and fairness. Um, and, and then different uh, operators of people in that ecosystem have different um, I would say incentives or nudges uh, that, that get them to move in that direction. Now, uh, speaking in the context of brands and businesses that we're working with, I think there's a lot of paralysis in some ways. While competition can be healthy and efficient, uh, the problem of coordination in competition right, becomes one of the biggest factors. There, right? So where do you get the signal? And we're always, I mean, the brands and businesses are all, it's, it's incredible, right? So to get the first few movers, um, you know, to get them started on this journey, whether on the environment or on the social dimensions of sustainability. And of course, environmental dimensions, people have been building business cases on cost efficiency and so on and so forth. The social has always been somewhat harder, I should say. Um, and, and that's also because it has a very deep connection uh, to, to the uh, operational costs and ongoing business models, right? When you start talking about the social sustainability. But I think when we see uh, overcome and find ways of overcoming this coordination challenges, or when the cycle can start moving in the positive direction with some of the early movers, therefore prompting the rest of the industry, uh, you know, there's a big FOMO aspect as well, uh, which the industry kind of has, right? Uh, uh, which is to say that, hey, the early adopters are going to get all the benefits. And so it, it also starts off in that. But the coordination challenge is a big one. Uh, regulation, um, as we're seeing increasingly, uh, plays a role in that in providing that framework to say, hey, everybody needs to jump up or move in that direction. Um, and so in, and in more recent times, in the last few years, definitely we're seeing um, regulation pointing to the direction of also looking at social. So I, I refer to the human rights due to due diligence-based laws which are coming in Europe, um, the modern slavery acts that have come in Australia, in UK, adopted by California, duty of vigilance. Even in our own country, we've got the national guidelines on uh, responsible business conduct, right? So we're seeing, you know, it's not just the, that Global North is doing, even in India, the Ministry of Co Corporate Affairs is trying to bring this in through the SEBI and other regulations. So that's one way in which we can kind of address um, and kind of get the, the business community to, to move. The other, uh, I would say, um, would be the consumer. And, and I'd like to just uh, take a minute to talk about a great initiative called Passion Revolution globally. I would say it's the world's largest consumer movement promoting sustainable and responsible consumption. Uh, and they're looking at it in, again, a very holistic way in trying to redefine consumption, right? So not just looking at overconsumption, 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 but how do we look at slowing down and then repurposes? And we've all spoken about it, so I don't have to elaborate on that, but redefining consumption, 
right? And that consumer signal can be a very powerful uh, tool as well, because um, a part of my work is constantly trying to talk to businesses and brands in India. Um, and what is incredible is that even if, where there are businesses and brands who've committed to sustainable practices in Europe or America, when they have a presence or a retail presence in India, uh, and you talk to the business leaders here, they are, they're constantly talking about, but here nobody cares about it, right? There's no consumer who's asking us, for this. why should we invest more? So slightly kind of a cynical approach to uh, sustainability to say, hey, if the consumer asks, we're going to give them. If they don't, then we're just going to go on the cost side and put on the discounts and forget about all the social parameters uh, along with sustainability. So, but but I think that consumer side, and we're seeing a consumer movement evolving even in India, certainly the youngsters in urban India are driving some of that conversation. So I think that consumer signaling is also very important. Uh, I think, yeah, for, it, it's appropriate at a platform uh, you know, like Sankalp, we talk about the role investors can play and, and you know, responsible um, investors demanding certain ESG based for both debt and equity parameters uh, on which they would like to invest. So if you do not fulfill those things, and it should be a hygiene factor, it shouldn't be, oh, well, if you do it, great, I give you extra brownie points. ESG, especially on the social aspects as well ensuring that there is no exploitation in your value chains of the environment, but also of the people, needs to be a high being factor. So investors, and we're seeing time and time again, whether it's in the secondary markets or the primary market, whether in debt or equity, investors can hold a huge sway. Uh, and businesses listen, uh, I mean, period. So I think that's another mechanism that can really kind of help us move in a coordinated manner in, in, in this direction. Uh, and, and when you talk about the SME segment, I think just linking it all together, it then becomes a business development opportunity. So invest, uh, incentivizing the SMEs to get access to better markets, supporting them um, to with the market linkages. Uh, you know, business doesn't need to be a bad word. We need to kind of get it moving in the right spirit and direction um, and support. And, and so then that's also something that we constantly do, uh, which is facilitating market linkages for those who commit to these better practices. So that would be, I, I, yeah, I hope I haven't spoken too much, but that would be what I would say uh, would be the mechanism. Yeah, thanks, thanks. But basically, if I may say that what you are also saying that there are multiple stakeholders who have to be incentivized differently. The consumer is a massive piece of this story. Uh, and, you know, we are obviously seeing that kind of shift. And I remember reading recently that, uh, you know, co during, during COVID, I think there are about over 200,000 people who were, who just Googled local and, you know, ethical and sustainable, which I thought was a really interesting uh, point, uh, just from how we need to, the consumers themselves are shifting. And to speak to your uh, point about investors, I think investors do have a very integral role to play uh, because uh, if um, ESG targets and sustainability is tied in some ways to capital and access to capital, then also that shift to new ways of thinking and business models can potentially happen faster as opposed to slowing down. Um, but here, um, I'll let me I'll stop talking and I, it's time for us to take a quick video break. Um, what, uh, and before we do that, uh, yeah, just, yeah, a quick video break uh, and then we'll see you in about two minutes. My name is Ambika. I am Malaysia from Malaysia. I have a paper for the first time. We have a paper for the central. We have a paper for the central. We have a paper for the first time. 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 Semua orang itu semua orang jenaku kalsa kodi, itu semua orang jenaku sambla kodi, na u mada la. Nampun na mada beran tu niaya keltira. Nampun ke barat desa dali, yau kalsa kalta na wan bitto, beri yau kalsa itu mada bodoh anta nampun ke akhi de. Nampun ke mur makli dera, mur makli school gokta dera. Na u idri indah na jiwa mada ira do. Nampun na nilsi anta niaya keltira. Kard kodi dera nampun ke, nampun de un sanga madi divi, asiru dala na tu nampun de sanga. 
ನಾವೇ ಒಂದು ಸಂಘ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ನಾವೇ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇರೋದು ಇದರಲ್ಲಿ ಯಾರು ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜರ್ ಅಂತ ಇಲ್ಲ ಯಾರೂ ಇಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ತೋಟಿ ಅಂತ ಯಾಕೆ ಹೇಳ್ತೀರ ನಮ್ಮನ್ನ ಯಾಕೆ ಹಂಗೆ ಹೇಳೋಕ್ಕೆ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಯಾರು ರೂಲ್ಸ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದು ಎಷ್ಟು ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತೀರಮ್ಮ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅವರೇ ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ರೀಸೈಕಲ್ ಒಂದು ತಿಂಗ್ ಒಂದು ದಿನಕ್ಕೆ ಒಂದು ಟನ್ ರೀಸೈಕಲ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ನಾವು ಇವಾಗ ನಾವು ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇರೋದ್ರಿಂದ ಎಷ್ಟೋ ಮರನ ನಾವು ಕಾಪಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಎಷ್ಟೋ ಇದನ್ನ ರೀಸೈಕಲ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ನಾವು ಆಯ್ದಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂದರೆ ಎಷ್ಟು ಕಸ ಬಿದ್ದೋಗುತ್ತೆ ನಾವು ಆಯೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಕಸ ಎಲ್ಲ ಕಮ್ಮಿ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅವ್ರಿಗೂ ನಾವು ಸೇವ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ ಯಾಕಂದರೆ ಇಷ್ಟು ಕಸನ ಅವ್ರು ತೊಗೊಂಡೋಗಿ ಹಾಕೋಕ್ಕೆ ಎಷ್ಟು ಖರ್ಚು ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಒಂದು ಒಬ್ಬೊಬ್ಬರು ಒಂದೊಂದು ಕಡೆ ಒಂದು ಟನ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸಾವಿರ ಟನ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಒಂದು ದಿನಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾವಿರ ಟನ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ನಾವು ರೀಸೈಕ್ಲು ಅಷ್ಟು ಟನ್ನು ಅವ್ರು ತೊಗೊಂಡೋಗಿ ಹಾಕಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಗೆ ಎಷ್ಟು ಖರ್ಚಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಎಂಬತ್ತ್ಮೂರು ಕೋಟಿ ರೂಪಾಯಿ ನಾವು ಸೇವ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಒಂದು ದಿನಕ್ಕೆ ಇವರು ಕಾರ್ಪೇಸ್ನವ್ರಿಗೆ ಅವರೇ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ನೀವು ಮಾಡೋದು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಕೆಲಸಮ್ಮ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀರಾ ಅಂತ ಅವರೇ ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಸಂಘ ಬಂದಿದ್ದಕ್ಕೆ ನಮಗೆ ಸೆಂಟ್ರ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವಾಗ ಸೆಂಟ್ರ್ ನಡೆಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಇವಾಗ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅವರೇ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತೀರ ಅಂತ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾರೆ thousand tons of waste and uh, i'm just amazed at how articulate uh, ambika is and if she stood for elections i'd vote for her 83 crores saved thanks to uh, just recycling waste and she's very clear that she's no scavenger um so uh, here that i'd like to bring in christina um designing waste uh, out designing out of waste is no longer a choice for any of us so from yeh perspective and given your work with waste focused businesses uh, what are some of these op- you know opportunities for jobs that you're seeing opening up and how do we formalize uh, you know the waste management systems uh, while ensuring economic as well as social justice thanks priya uh, yeah amazing video i i loved how important her voice was and uh, i completely agree with her we should we, we should uh, stop um uh, calling these people waste pickers or scavengers. We should rather call them street beautifiers, um, environment caretakers, because they are doing uh, a job that nobody else wants to do. And um, they are doing it for for very little uh, compensation. And one thing there that fundamentally needs to change is that um, um, they are not being paid for the material that they're collecting, but for the environmental service that they're doing. Um, that's one thing that uh, we at UNOS Environment Hub are, are working on, um, which also comes with, with living wages uh, that, that, that Abhishek um, highlighted, um, um, which is also one of the root causes why there is certain types of materials that are still ending up in the environment, because there's no value, because they are hard to recycle, because there's no value on the market, and only certain fractions are being collected because there is a value. And um, that, for one thing, um, will prevent us for um, things leaking into the environment, as well as the, the proper um, compensation of these people doing these fantastic job. And um, it also comes with, with the safeguards and, and, and social um, securities that, that you mentioned that um, uh, can be included by of course, one option is formalizing their work, which is not, of, not, not always possible because often they are not doing this work full time. It's rather a part time job that they are doing, that they're doing occasionally, that they're doing as a side job to, to create an extra income for, for their families. And um, also for that, some that actually want to prefer to stay independent. And um, I mean, I even know base pickers who, who left that job, who were working at factories at very you know, um, um, uh, poor conditions and that actually left the job and do the waste picking instead now um, because they are seeing their better opportunities for for themselves. Um, A a way to still um, integrate or or provide them with social securities would be extended producer responsibility schemes. There are very little schemes um, implemented in countries that also integrate informal workers. Mostly this is only done through formalized businesses, um, but that could also be uh, one option. 
And um, uh, talking about um, some of the examples of, of social businesses, I want to highlight uh, a few examples or, or general business models that we are seeing. Um, and as we said in the beginning, circular economy starts with um, the product design, with preventing waste in the first place, but also designing products that are made for recycling or for reuse. We have one social business in Bangladesh that is called um, Grameen Uniqlo, which is a collaboration with uh, the Japanese brand uh, Uniqlo that manufactures and sells clothes in Bangladesh at a reasonable price for the local people, which is something very special because most of what is getting produced in Bangladesh is being exported. And um, all of the profits in the business are being uh, reinvested um, um, for the benefit of the people in, in Bangladesh to provide um, equal opportunity for of work for employee by introducing um, a very comprehensive and unique welfare system by um, providing work and study internship programs for students to the to the for the children of the workers also uh, interest free loan program for health or education purposes and also um, as a next step contributing to to industrial development for factory workers um, through um, manufacturing through support of manufacturing technology and know-how transfer, also educational support programs. And, and finally, Grameen Uniqlo is also supporting socially vulnerable people, especially in disaster situations, um, by um, uh, offering the, the, the clothes at a, at a very affordable and low price. And all of the products that they are manufacturing are made not only affordable, but from functional materials that are adapted to the climate and the, the climate conditions in the country, but also being more, made more durable. Um, so we prevent waste in the first place. Another example is the preservation of um, handicrafts, um, um, traditional um, weaving uh, techniques. Um, uh, Grameen Czech, another example from Bangladesh, um, you know, the iconic shirts and the, the Punjabi that versus a Yunus is wearing, those are made from Grameen Chak. And um, these are mainly, they come directly from, from village-based traditional weavers who are um, processing um, the, the fabrics that are then um, made into, into garments that are both sold uh, nationally in Bangladesh and also overseas. Another example, uh, Grameen Fashion and Fabrics, they are producing um, um, products for um, uh, special groups such as um, sanitary napkins for low income um, uh, female households. And these um, sanitary pads are made from cloth so that they're they are washable and reusable, again, preventing waste. Um, plus, um, they are being offered at an affordable price to a group that otherwise might not even have any kind of um, uh, napkins, and uh, you're also solving a, a, a health issue there. And then um, we are also looking at um, business models where um, um, entrepreneurs are looking to produce garments from sustainable sources. Um, I mean, organic cotton has been there for a very long time, but also looking at innovative materials, for example, bamboo, which is a material that, that grows um, very fast and, and, and sustainably, and um, entrepreneurs are using that as, a, as an input material to, to produce yarn and, and, and garments. And then, um, yeah, finally, the models that we mentioned before, when it comes to the upcycling of waste, where um, you're using that as an input, which of course often comes with the challenges that you have um, not necessarily always a continuous stream of one type of material. So again, you need to be very creative when it comes to the product design or where you're putting in the materials. And um, that again is a call for the, for the, for the brands industry to look especially uh, on mono materials, because as soon as you have a, a yarn that consists of different material, it's, it's almost impossible to, to recycle it. And, um, Probably there, I mean, there are still a few uh, examples where you can reuse them by putting them as filling material for, for cushions in the, in the building sector, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, lo lots, of, lots of different lots of opportunities. Yeah, yeah lots, lots of amazing examples. And I hope the audience is listening in because these are great ways in which we can also adapt. 
Um, and I'm also, I want to be mindful of time. Um, this is going to be the last round of questions and we're already seeing a lot of questions from the audience coming in. So I'm going to quickly jump to something uh, from the waste uh, and the circular aspect of it. I'd like to uh, touch upon something that Abhishek had brought up uh, earlier in the conversation where um, can we zoom out a bit and talk about, you know, the farm to consumer value chain. Uh, and you, Abhishek, you had mentioned earlier at uh, looking beyond just the factory floor and the consumer chain, and also talking from farm and farm workers perspective and farm as a workplace. Uh, could you perhaps elaborate more on how these, you know, this integrated value chain, how do we need to start looking at uh, value chains as being integrative in some sense? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Priya. Yeah, I think, um, I think yeah, we're seeing the movement, and I think it's incredible examples that Christina has talked about, where we're talking about waste during production, but also post consumption and bringing that back into a productive way. Um, and I think everybody who's involved in it, uh, whether in on the factory floor, whether uh, you know, repurposing and bringing that that material back into the industry, or I would say even at the origin of some of the raw materials being produced. Uh, at the farms. I think we need to look at it in an integrated approach, right? And, and increasingly um, the circular economy demands that. Um, what we've seen historically is that um, the, the focus has been on only specific dimensions of sustainability. So more obviously on the environmental side as we've spoken about before, um, and also in specific chunks. And then, you know, we kind of break it up and then it kind of uh, in many ways devalues the whole chain in different pieces. Uh, what we're seeing at the factory from sorry from the factory all the way down uh, to the farm so fair trade has recently kind of introduced uh, and gone beyond our, our work in the start um, for over a decade and a half has been more in the context of what's happening at the farm uh, so looking particularly with smallholder cotton farmers um, you know looking at the conditions which are leading to uh, lack of sustainability at the farms uh, economically socially and environmentally um, you know, you, I think Priya, you talked about lack of access to finance, but that is one of the things that is probably the biggest contributors to exploitation across the chain um, and lack of sustainability across the chain. And, and so this affects the farmers as well. So I think the economics of it is in, important. Uh, and then what that does is that it creates pressure on the social and the environmental as well. So uh, what we're looking at is uh, creating a framework where we get commitments at the farm level uh, for better conditions and ensuring better working practices, uh, both in the context of health and safety uh, and hygiene, but also in the context of not, ex not using exploitative labor and not being discriminative at the farm level. Uh, and then taking that on further into the value chain. So more recently, we've now also going are going quite deeply into the textiles industry to look at how in the textile sector, uh, it's important that uh, the similar principles of helping people um, you know, optimize, but at the same time also recognize their rights and, and what is fair, right? So getting workers also to, to build their capacity, build the capacity of managers and the management and to work collectively to move towards this coordinated sustainability model. So, we're starting at the farm where it's the farmers, it's the it's probably the seasonal worker who, who, are, who are also working there, um, ensuring that they have a sustainable income and a livelihood, which I mean, in many ways, farmers are also entrepreneurs, right? They, they put in money, they, you know, they are put in a lot of hard work. Um, and, and then at the end of a cycle, production cycle, they expect a return, which hopefully covers the cost of production and gives them an income. I mean, in the context of climate change, that's probably one of the riskiest businesses in the world. Um, but but what we're seeing is that how we can bring them together in collectives of farmer producer companies or cooperatives and help de-risk that, and also then put in these better practices for work there. And there's a lot lot of room uh, for uh, developing that. Further up the value chain, working with uh, the workers, building their capacity and uh, getting them um, to also then be partners in a dialogue with management on the working conditions. Um, and at businesses as well, I mean, in, in the SME segment, you know, everybody's looking to their buyers. Uh, so the businesses themselves also kind of, whether through access to finance, uh, whether through uh, access to better markets, uh, you know, getting that incentive framework 
through which they, they then embrace um, you know, these better practices. Uh, we, we are beginning to see businesses um, in the manufacturing sector in India. Uh, more recently, Pure Courts recently as a manufacturer has started working on our textile standards, uh, which basically involves that they get uh, in a six year horizon, they start paying a living wage uh, to the workers there, right? But they're doing this on a hope that they will attract enough businesses and brands uh, who will then allow them a critical mass of that extra income to share with the workers. So, I mean, there are early adopters and movers in that, um, and, uh, you know, but there's a signaling process also that we're trying to do through our fair trade textile standards. And we're seeing businesses. I mean, there are also early brands in Europe, uh, Three Friends, Switcher, uh, you know, who are also saying that, yeah, okay, if we see the supply side commitment, we are willing to come forward. So it's, all, it's about that coordinated effects to say, hey, we don't need to race to the bottom to an exploitative cycle. We can work towards together to also try and raise the game. And, and that's where we are working across the value chain from the farm to the factory. And of course, the dialogue with the consumer to make this happen. Thank you, Abhishek. Um, I mean, this coordinated effort is something that we, I think it's emerging as almost a theme now. Um, and Vivek, I'm not going to come to you right now. Uh, I'm leaving you for the, for the end, because I think that's a very important discussion for us to have. But just building on Abhishek's, uh, um, you know, uh, conversation around and he, uh, him touching upon um, worker protection, living wages, and those kind of things. Uh, Jennifer, Appa, could, could we perhaps talk about how do we ensure this kind of worker protect, protection and safety nets, uh, nets from a regulatory uh, standpoint as well as an industry's pra uh, practice standpoint? Um, and what are some of the things that we, I mean, you know, the people in this room perhaps can, you know, even get started with? Uh, with our own organizations and the kind of work that we're doing? I think um, if we come to the pandemic also, there were so many things that we realized. Um, social protection safety nets were not there. And we had to sort of, I, I mean, food was given, various people had certain interventions, but there wasn't things that um, were very formalized. So social protection safety nets are very important. I think the pandemic has taught us that. Um, and that is something um, government needs to look into. And as we talk about the value chain also, the informal sector, um, laws and regulations are not there. So you don't even know that how many people there are and um, who is for Pulling out, I mean, it was sort of mapping that had to happen, which we observed. So um, there is opportunity now and learning, I think, from the pandemic to actually understand that social protection safety nets are very important, both for the formal and the informal economy, and much more for the eco informal economy. Um, government did give subsidies out for. Um, the RNG sector on paying workers low interest rate loans, et cetera, for worker salaries, uh, which benefited Bangladesh in the sense that overnight, um, everyone went onto the digitized platform because government said that unless you have mobile banking, um, you cannot um, the, get avail the benefit. And so salaries were paid into workers' accounts. Um, a way forward to transparency and also so when the push comes um, things happen and things happen for the good through transparency getting on mobile platforms um, and and government did give that subsidy but the fallout for the informal workers um, in this entire value chain, there, there was a miss there. Uh, and, and we realized that tracking that was important. So government needs to take a holistic approach. It's not a single part, uh, stakeholder that can manage this. It's government, brands, um, the factory owners. Everyone has a role to play um, to ensure social safety nets. We also had the new poor coming in. So mid-management, the lower mid-management who are more on the clerical and those sort of roles, 
they lost jobs and they, they couldn't beg on the streets or do anything. So um, we, a new poor was created. Where are the social safety nets for those sort of um, interventions? So yes, policy makers need to work to look into these issues, very important. Um, brands should sort of um, support in sort of ensuring that because there were a lot of cancellation of orders. And then what happened, the factories cancellations, deferred payments and all of that. Um, and then factories were also in a tight fix. Um, but I guess everybody understood everyone was in problems, um, but everyone was trying to sort of support themselves. Um, but I think this also brought in that coordinated efforts are so important. Uh, long-term partnerships, supporting each other, um, having government, having brands, having factory owners work together to bring in a common good and support each other's back when there is a crisis moment. Uh, and that is something that we need to learn from this. I'm bringing in the pandemic because the social protection issue came so much then. We realized it so much at that time. So in developing the regulations, in developing the um, for formal, informal and the value supply chain and how brands can actually, and you talk about the human rights due diligence that is coming now, it's so much important that we sort of address this in a holistic way because it's not one stakeholder cannot do it. And I think that is the way forward for say us to, um, if, if this is, industry is to survive, and this is in the global south itself, that these issues for every country need to be addressed so that in a holistic approach, and we can learn from each country in the global south of what works well and what doesn't work in devising these regulations and looking into this supply chain. And if we work coordinatedly, I think every country benefits and uh, I think the sector benefits also. So. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you, Jennifer. Appa. And I think uh, there's no doubt, I think, in all our minds uh, today that uh, what we're taking on and as we try to move towards a, a circular approach, there is this is not a one person's job or a one organization's job. Uh, unless we sort of, you know, come together in forums like this, because I mean, I've learned so much just by listening to you. Uh, and how do we intentionally create th those kind of collaborations and partnerships? And this is really where uh, Vivek, I'd love you to come in because uh, IKEA Foundation has been committed to taking a collaborative approach. Um, and we'd love to hear from you on, uh, for one, why did, does it matter to you as a foundation? And two, how can partnerships be designed uh, to be human-centric uh, while ensuring positive social outcomes, especially from, um, you know, philanthropic perspective, from brand perspective, and so on and so forth. Yeah, thanks, Priya. I think uh, uh, it's good that, you know, you, you put this question to me at this stage on the partnerships and how it would look like in the future. And I was, as I was hearing to everyone and, you know, also reflecting on the proceedings uh, so far. I mean, let me uh, make four points. The first point is that um, there is a need for a holistic approach. Uh, across the whole value chain. And what I mean by this is that, uh, for example, we need to uh, collectively bridge the gap, let's say between the innovators and the manufacturers to uh, promote large scale uptake of some of these uh, solutions, the green solutions and the models and the approaches that we are talking about. The second thing I will again highlight is that, uh, which we have again, we all agree to is that uh, we need to be working forcefully with uh, small and growing uh, businesses and building their, you know, capabilities to integrate them in the entire value chain. And this is keeping, you know, the whole uh, business as well as the social considerations in mind. Now, uh, if you if you really look at, you know, the and I really congratulate the Conclave, the CIF Conclave team for the theme of this year's uh, uh, Conclave, which is on, you know, sustainable business is good business. And that's where I would say that when we talk about partnerships, we need to bring that into a vision, the vision of you know, looking at uh, bringing in circularity, uh, regeneration or regenerative principles in our approach, in our vision, uh, 
keeping the future generations in mind because that's where you know sustainability will really take strong roots. The uh, second point I wanted to highlight was uh, so this was all under the first point. The second point was uh, we need to build and strengthen coalitions of the willing and like-minded organizations, convening them together for coordinated action, and particularly the private sector. And CAIF is uh, doing a pretty good job in this space, but this needs to be further amplified and strengthened. And partnership has to have a mission mode approach. Uh, otherwise, you know, it just cannot achieve its stated goals and objectives, uh, especially when we're talking about moving towards a circular textile sector or circular economy, because the transition is quite complex. It's quite checkered. And we, are all, we all who are working in this sector, we experience this. The other aspect uh, with respect to you know, this coalition of the willing uh, I wanted to highlight is that we need to have a beginner's mindset, uh, having the flexibility to experiment, moving with agility and ready to take risks uh, without fearing to fail because you know, uh, invariably that's going to happen along the journey. So in a nutshell, partnerships need to have an entrepreneurial spirit going forward. Uh, before I conclude, I want to make a point on, you know, uh, how do we build the sector and the field? So we need to have partnerships that come together uh, and through the networks, we identify what's working, what's not, what is the evidence, uh, what are the gaps? And together we try to plug in those gaps because invariably we land up uh, reinventing the wheel because we are not working together. We are not work network, we are not convening together. And I think uh, unknowingly, that happens unknowingly, we invest a lot of our time and resources there. So I think we need to stop doing that consciously. And I would say uh, by, to conclude, I mean, I'm just again building on what I've been hearing that you know, collaboration and partnerships are hard and time consuming. Uh, and we need to have a long-term perspective. Uh, it really requires patience. It requires mutual respect. It requires trust, value alignment, and most importantly, letting go of uh, individual egos. Uh, do you know, to ensure that there is a level playing field and being a part of a collective platform, it also takes away your unilateral or uh, uh, you know, the sense of control, sense of decision-making for the benefit of everyone. So, and this is not easy to do. So it, it requires a lot of effort to make it happen. So are we ready? to embrace all of this, if you really want to work or partner at a scale and for scale. And I believe the answers are within us. Thank you so much, um, uh, Vivek. Um, and so agree with you, uh, putting aside the ego for the greater good. I mean, that's such a tough challenge. And I think even the collaboratives that have come about uh, are struggling to navigate how it needs to move forward. But Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we have a ton of questions and I want to be mindful uh, that we addressed all of them. Uh, my first question uh, that I have in front of me is um, around skill development programs, which is a really interesting uh, aspect that uh, someone has uh, addressed. Um, and uh, how, do, um, oh, how do skill development programs address literacy challenges, especially in communities such as women? Uh, because literacy becomes a big factor in upskilling in all of the, uh, you know, in the upward mobility of women, in, especially in the management space. Um, and is literacy, when uh, organizations such as BRAC or IKEA or, uh, you know, Unisocial Business, when you're designing programs, is literacy regularly included in programs? And is there insight, uh, any insight from the panel uh, that can share on how such complex individual development is facilitated, especially in South Asia? Um, could I invite perhaps uh, Jennifer or uh, Christina to respond to this question on literacy, especially for women and upskilling and upward mobility of women? Um, Christina, would you like to go ahead? Or shall I? Okay. Um, Yes, lit lit literacy is important and has to be embedded in curriculum. But if you, few things that uh, I had on mind on this aspect was that 
if we talk about production floor, floor workers um, who are operating the machines, um, they will need advanced skill sets on your um, multi-skilling. Multi-skilling where you do not need very advanced level literacy there. Um, you need basics um, and you're um, going into supervisory levels, the soft skills part, these uh, vocational trainings can take place. So it's not, people always say that education and all that is so key to it. But when you talk of operational level, say they're becoming senior managers, they're becoming managers, line managers, etc. We're not talking about big literacy in these areas, vocational trainings. We've we've done it, so we know that what it what what would entail there. Then again, you talk about say people on the mid managers who are wanting to go on the upper positions. Um, yeah, those literacies are important, and um, those universities the, that need to expand because the Global South is working very much on this area. Circularity issues are coming in. Um, your various um, areas are coming in on this. So that course is designed and um, brought into universities so that people can actually go into that. And that we're talking about mid-management and upper mid-management skills. Where the literacy is there, there is a gap in the university education right now, which needs to come in, addressing the new thing challenges that are coming in. And Brack University is actually working right now on um, basically tailor-made courses for the RMG sector, management systems and all of that. So, so that um, a long-term sustainable vision is there. And I'm sure India and other countries um, are working on it, or maybe it is in the process because circularity, the new innovations that come in, that education of mid and upper mid. So everyone's literacy does not have to be the same. We need to be very conscious of that and then tailor make that literacy accordingly. And for BRAC, like BRAC itself is working on the mass level of the operating floor workers and BRAC University is addressing the mid and upper mid management to adapt to the new innovations that are coming in. So, so, and I'm sure that others are working in this space also, it's important, but what type of literacy, how much has to be customized? Because you cannot expect an operator flow to basically be a, be a honest degree holder suddenly now. And the important other aspect of it is that um, when we um, talk about these things is that, um, being able to adapt and be agile. And this is where all these perceptions come in, that men and women and this and that, but actually literacy is considered as important, but very customized to um, what needs to happen. Thank you. Uh, I, can, I can only underline that. If you're looking at um, the first generation of Grameen Bank borrowers, uh, mostly women, all illiterate and they all managed to set up a business. Yet at the same time, one condition for them to take a loan was that they send their children to school to make sure that the next generation is literate. And then on the next level, also providing educational interest-free loans so that these children could also be sent to university. So that's why on our side, we are always looking to integrate those social aspects, including the educational aspects that we can close this gap that currently exists. Um, thank you so much, Christina and Jennifer. Uh, I'm mindful of time. And before we uh, wrap up the session, uh, we'll quickly go into one uh, short video um, and then wrap it up. Thank you so much for all of you to, for being here, for being patient with us, for all the audience who's been, who've stuck around. Uh, so we'll just quickly move into a video and come back. मी माधुरी राजेश धर्मोमेर राणा चारोटी मी थे महालक्ष्मी महिला बचत बर्तन पांच वर्षा पसन्द काम करते 
Thank you all. I think we are almost at the end of our time. Um, and I just like to take a very quick opportunity I mean, take this time to thank the audience for your time uh, and patience uh, and a big shout out to all the speakers. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot from just listening to uh, the work that you've been doing and Kef and your team at Kef really for recognizing the need for this conversation, which I think is really, really, in, you know, vital in the times that we live in. Um, I'll hand over uh, uh, the podium, as it were, to Somatish, who will take us through the next steps. Thank you all. I mean, I mean, the kind of insights uh, that came uh, from all of uh, you know our esteemed speakers was just amazing. I mean, we've been all busy taking notes. <laughs> a big thank you to Priya uh, for moderating, you know, in a lovely you know kind of manner in this entire panel. Uh, thank you so much for to all our panelists for a fantastic session. And thank you to all the participants. Hope you enjoyed the session. I would just like to highlight that you know this was the social dimension that we covered, you know, the social dimension of sustainable or a circular kind of transition. We have two other sessions lined up which will touch upon the other two dimensions, the business, the economic aspects of it, which is basically our next session lined up at 2 p.m. Uh, which is called business case for a circular textile economy. And then uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, a very, very interesting, you know, session, which is really talk, going to focus on the private sector's role in getting to net zero, which is the environmental aspect. So big thank you to everyone and hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Stay at uh, CIF Conclave. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.